Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. And today I'm very excited because we have Douglas Weissman here, and he is a fiction author, and he's also a screenwriter. And he ha he's here to tell us a little about himself and what he does, and he has some really great information to share with us. So, Douglas, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Absolutely. So I am a writer. I tell stories. I share stories. I collect stories. And I do that in the form of both fiction writing, screenwriting, but also I'm a travel writer. So I have the luxurious and lovable job of going all over the world and just meeting new people, experiencing new things and sharing that with others around the world. And it's exceptional. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. How do you like being a travel um, writer? Because, you know, I, I've always I've read books about people who travel, you know, worldwide. And, you know, they talk about they go from country to country and they talk about town from town, you know, what they experience. And it's so, you know, it, it's it's to me, it's so uh, it, it just it inspires me. It just excites me, I guess. And uh, so what what you know, what made you be a travel um, writer? Is this something Something that you always wanted to do or is you always love to travel since you were young? I have loved traveling. So it's not something that I ever saw myself doing being a travel writer, but it's something that I'm happy that I fell into. It actually came across because I was traveling so much and I found this article on Craigslist. So that's how I date myself because it was from Craigslist was like a viable opportunity for jobs. And they were looking for writers who had been to certain spaces, uh, I think it was like Australia, Italy, and, and another country, and I'd been to two out of the three. So I sent them samples from a blog that I was keeping, not for monetary purposes, but to keep family and friends abreast of what I was doing when I was traveling. And I cleaned it up, sent it in, and they liked what I had to say. So I was able to partner with them. Eventually, I got brought on full time. And I've been able to explore the world. And that's what really interests me. It's not so much about what I get to see, even though that's obviously a part, like who doesn't want to see the Colosseum in Rome, right. but also about those experiences I have while I'm there and the people that I meet while I'm there. And that's really what matters to me and what makes me keep going, going to a small town and seeing what it's like in that specific space is far more interesting to me than say going to a festival where there's 5,000 people from all over the world converging on that one space. Because right. That's that's less interesting to me. And that's totally fine for those who are intrigued by that. But I like to see what life is like, what the authentic culture is like, what the people are doing day to day and and how and how much of a perspective it gives me on my life and where I'm coming from and, and why and how it's different. And so those are the connections I like to make. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, how has this made you grow grown as a person? Because when you visit different uh, countries and you visit and you see different cultures and you see how others live, it kind of gives you sometimes a, dis, a different perspective on life. It makes you see things from kind of outside the box because not everybody gets to actually experience other cultures and how other people live. Has it changed you in any way? Oh, absolutely. I can't say for sure where I would have ended up in my life, both mentally, physically, career-wise, if I hadn't been doing this. Yeah. But I do know and recognize how I changed, how I grew, how I matured. And believe me, I'm still very immature. I'm still childish in a lot of ways that I cherish, especially because yeah. I have a three-year-old. So we connect on that three-year-old <laughs> level very easily. But at the same time, I'm far more aware of what other cultures do or don't have, what other people do or don't have, the the ways that I have been privileged in my life, in my family life, in the country that I was from, in the city that I was born into, and these other aspects that I might not have realized otherwise because I wasn't able to see outside that box. But it's a box that I like to peek outside of, jump outside of, then jump back into. I mean, it's definitely a comfort zone, but it's something that I like to tear open and take a look around and come back into. Now, what questions is some your uh, your readers kind of ask you? Because you know it's very intriguing when you when you have uh, you, when you're reading about something and it kind of sometimes you can read something and 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 make you you feel like you're a part of it. And you know, have you gotten any really interesting questions from readers when they read your you know your stories about different uh, parts of the world that you visited? I wouldn't say that I've gotten questions that maybe I was not expecting. You get a lot of questions like, where should I go or what should I see? Yes. But it's those are harder to answer because I don't know you. I don't know what you're interested in. And so right. I have a, a top five list of 
you know, good for everybody, right? Yeah. I mean, just generic answers. But when I know people and I know what they're interested in, I can give them far more specific examples. But what I do and how I write and how I travel, I believe that the specific experiences I have and the way that I write become universal. So even though it's me and my own experience, because of how meaningful they are to me, I can create far more connections with readers and the experiences they want to have or have had in the past. And those are really the meaningful, the meaningful commentary that I get back from readers as well, or when they're like, oh, how did you describe my experience, right? So if I'm there, yeah. my experience when I was in this space, because you're you and you had a completely different experience. But that's the thing. It's the awkwardness of telling a story or maybe not awkward because I love it so much. But yeah, just the interesting part about telling a story is the more specific you are and the more detailed you are about the experience that you had, not necessarily what you're seeing, but how it touches you, the more mm -hmm. universal that experience becomes. And, you know, and, and it kind of, I think when it, sometimes it can bring a bond in between you and the reader as well, because, you know, your interests are similar to their interests. That's why they're reading about you. They're reading about your articles on your blog. And, you know, sometimes uh, you kind of feel like you don't, you know, the person, even though you don't, because you're reading and you could relate to that person and, you know, you're sharing your own views. And I think people really do appreciate that, you know, when, you know, someone, you know, opens up. And, and share special events in their life and you know have has anyone ever you know to, told you how they appreciate you you know taking the time to go into this detail and you know and and share how you know how worthy and how you know your information is to them absolutely i mean there's definitely as you said there's kind of this authenticity to it and, and even a vulnerability to it and the way that you express yourself there is the way that people are going to be able to connect with you. And if you don't offer that, you just kind of have this superficial superficial level of information, people aren't really going to come back. I mean, they might find the one piece of information they're looking for and then go away, but there's no reason right. to come back when right. it had that need fulfilled, but they want something on a deeper level. And that's, that's the information that I try to share. Those are the touch points I try to hit when I'm writing, when I'm doing travel writing, when I'm writing my novels, when I'm writing my screenplays. It's that vulnerability and that authenticity that resonates with people and keeps them coming back for sure. Now, have you always wanted to be a writer? As far as I can remember, I loved writing, but I couldn't say I always wanted to be a writer. And that's partially yeah. because... I grew up in a time and space in which people said, oh, there's no money in that. There's there's yeah. no career future there. And right. I spent a long time and it really did mess with my mental health to, to struggle with the concept of what can I do? What will I do? Especially if it's not in this field. And so I did a lot of odd jobs that did, were not fulfilling and and it really affected me and my mental health because I wasn't happy and I would work tirelessly in these fields that were getting me nowhere and yeah. always want to circle back to writing anyway. So I finally just leaned into writing where even if I was working my, what is, what's the phrase, my fingers to the bone, yeah, I, I was still, I was happier doing it in this space than I was doing it in another space. Right. So basically you, you kind of went with your emotions and that kind of fulfilled your purpose. So you kind of followed, you know, what made you happy. And then, and, you know, and that was, you know, uh, writing and, and sharing your experiences and your thoughts with others. Absolutely. hundred percent. And I was able to find the ways to make money doing what I loved, as opposed to making money separate from what I loved and then trying to figure out where I can fit that passion as a hobby or a side gig or whatever it is into my life. And it's worked out for me. Right. You know, there's so many people I know in the writing field and they struggle trying to make a name for themselves and they, you know, and they, they try to, you know, they, they feel like there's no money in this, you know, they, they, you know, they want, they want to make it a career, but they, you know, they, they, they struggle financially trying to get to that certain level. You know, do you have any advice for those people who, are, you know, want to be well-known writers? Because so many people put out eBooks and they put out books and they are yeah. trying to get noticed but it's so hard because there's so many people out there writing so you have the competition is fierce do you have advice for people who really want to make a name for themselves and are sincere about it absolutely especially if they're sincere about it my biggest advice is the hardest advice it's the fact that it's a marathon not a sprint so 
you finish a first draft of a book, no matter if it's nonfiction, if it's ghostwriting, if it's a personal professional development book, or if it's a novel, you finish a first draft and that's incredible and it feels amazing and you just want to get it out into the world. But usually the first draft is not the draft that you publish. Right. My latest book, Life Between Seconds, it came out in November. It took 11 years to get that published. And wow. it's like that it took 11 years to write, but it took 11 years from, it took maybe three years to write the first draft. Then it took another year to query and realize I need to write more. So it took maybe five years to get all my drafts done, which in the end was about 11 drafts. And yeah. then another six years to query agents, to query publishers, to actually get it into the hands of a publisher, to then wait it out to get the revisions back and then make those changes the editor wanted and finally hit the bookshelves 11 years. And it's just, it's not that every book takes that long, but you just yeah. have to understand that with that commitment, if you want to get a name for yourself, get published traditionally, it can take a while. And then with it, it is a full-time marketing and PR push. I mean, if you want to get your name out there, you have to understand the business side. Yes. You have to be willing to do the podcasts, do the book blogs, do guest blogging, get on shows wherever you can. It, it's not like it's not like your book gets published and then all of the day shows are like knocking on your door and be like, come on our show. I mean, you got to put the time in and the research to know where you can go and who you yeah. can talk to and what audiences you fit with best. So it's it's part of the hustle, right. but if that's your intention and that's your goal, you can push forward and do it. It just takes focus. Right. You know, I think, I think, you know, so many people don't realize how much effort and how much time an author takes to actually write their book. Cause you see, I laugh sometimes cause I see so many things, you know, um, write a book and, and in three days, you know, like, like these, these, uh, these downloads that you see on the internet and stuff, but you know, Truly, it's not about how quick you write the book. It's it's you love the book. You love what you're doing, and you and quality, you know, beats quantity. You know, the amount of pages you can write in three days, or you know, a bunch yeah. of stuff you could slap together in three days. You know, it's really about you doing it right and taking the time and and taking the effort, and then, yeah. like you said, putting yourself out there. You know, because you know people don't realize, but even traditional book companies don't really do that much marketing for you. They do some, but they don't do that much. So it's really right. on you, right? Exactly. That's the big thing about traditional publishers, even the big publishers. If they don't believe in your book, you get great distribution, which means your book can be found all over the United States in bookstores. But at the same time, it might not be outward facing to yes. a customer and there's going to be no promotion behind it. And I mean, I love what you said about kind of doing it fast, but it's about quantity or quality, not quantity, because like Elizabeth Gilbert, who I love, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and she writes a lot of fiction, but people, when they talked about her after yeah. Eat, Pray, Love, they're like overnight success. When it's like, no, that was her fourth book. It's just, and, and the book to be an overnight success, it was like, I think something like 16 to 18 months before it hit this gigantic watershed moment of yeah. being everywhere all the time. And yet people refer to it as an overnight success, but it really was not like when you actually look at her career up to that point, And then the timeline of the book coming out to gaining popularity, right? Even beyond that, this idea of writers liking the prospect of being published as opposed to the actual writing yeah. of it. I love writing. I love the feeling when I sit down and I write and I get into the flow and the zone of writing. Yes. Where I have a lot of writer friends who just like the past tense, they like to have written, right? So they want the book to be done, but they don't want to put in the work to write the book. Right. Or I, I like both. So yeah, like, that's a meal ticket for me because I can just, I can sit down and write. And then when I'm done writing, I'm happy to talk to people about what I wrote and I'm happy right. to put the book and I can talk about it all day like I'm doing now. So, yeah. it, so it's, I, I hit all those, those points and someone who can do that is, is going to have a lot more energy at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree totally with you because it took me over five years just to research my one of my beginning books. You know, it was like, you know, it, it took like years for me to put that book together. And then finally, you know, I finally finished the book and it did really well. But it was like so much research had to go into it and so much time. And, it, you know, if you really, you know, love what you do, it, it, it could be draining doing all the rough drafts and doing all, you know, and and going through it and moving chapters around. But in the end, you you have that drive, you have that energy, that passion that keeps, it keeps you going. And like you said, you could talk about it forever and you could see your friends going, oh, 
oh, <laughs> when are they going to stop? I have enough with this book, you know, but yeah. it's yeah. something that makes you happy inside, you know? Exactly. I mean, five years just on the research. Did Did you find that with the next project, the next book, that it was less time? Or was it kind of like you saw it going down that same pathway? In, I, in I the, ne the next time I wrote my next book was less it took less time because I had the the research I had all the knowledge and you know I and then I was writing more from my own experience you know so I took what I learned and then I was talking a lot I, I was talking about the the power of positive thinking and taking yeah. the you know you know what drove me and you know to want to have positive thinking and and what made me you know and what it did to me and so it was like you know, it, it was, it, it was, it took less time, but then it took a, a while to edit the book and took a while to query the book. And it took a while to, you know, move chapters around, as you said, and then getting someone to actually want the book, you know, so it does take, it is a, a whole process that goes into it. It is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, over and over again, it's, it's this thing where like writers that have a big name still put in that time. It's just a little easier possibly because, they can get to a wider audience with larger shows because of their notoriety already. Right. But they're still doing the same thing. They're still doing the same amount of writing, revising, talking to editors, moving chapters around, and yes. then publicizing and marketing at the end of the day. So no matter how many books you put out, you're still putting in the same amount of work. It's just that you might understand how to write your book a little better the second time or a little faster the second time. Right. And I think the more you write, the better you get, you know, oh, yeah. and- I think it is so it gets a little bit easier because then you kind of understand the the proper way to do things. So, you know, you're learning from your mistakes, you know, because I feel like I, I couldn't remember what author it was, but there was an author I was listening to um, a couple of days ago and they said their first couple of books was total crap because they, you know, they were just learning. And then, you know, it was like that third or fourth book that like really hit the bestsellers and really did well because they, they, they got better and better at it and they learned and they un finally understood how everything should go together and how it actually what the finished product needs to look like so it could be a trial and error also for some authors I think oh 100 percent. there's that phrase that says uh, I might be paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly how it goes but it's yeah. something along the lines of you learn more from your mistakes than your successes yeah because if you win or you do something well you don't sit there and analyze what worked right or you might miss why it worked and but if you fail you learn pretty quickly what you did wrong. And as long as you come back to it and then use what you learned, you can grow and succeed. And right. that's why, because I've made every mistake you can as a writer. I yeah. you know, queried agents all at once with one blanket query that they hate <laughs> and that they can see when you do that as well. Right. Uh, I have sat there and just flooded my stories with detail that were unnecessary to the scene to the point right. that readers get confused because they don't understand what's actually important. I've sat there and tried to generalize a character thinking it would be more universal when actually, right. like I said earlier, the more specific you make someone or a setting or a detail, the more universal it becomes, not the more generic you make it. Yes. And so these just are examples that I've learned so much from those, but they're definitely mistakes that you might not realize you're making because you are doing it for a reason, thinking one or thing or the other, when really in the end, it's actually detrimental to your writing and to yes. the reading experience. Yes, definitely. Now you've written several books. How many books have you written? So Life Between Seconds, the most recent release is my eighth novel. And then I have a ninth one coming out next year, next winter, or mm -hmm. possibly January of 2024. The release date is, the release date is not set yet. Oh, that's great. Now, what is your current book that's out right now? What is that about? So Life Between Seconds is about a 20-something-year-old American male and a 70-something-year-old Argentinian female and the friendship they form based upon their respective traumas. Right. And it's really a concentration on grief and this idea that friendship can help you heal, but also yeah. what happens when you've lived with your trauma for so long that you're actually afraid to let it go. Right. 
And I think for some people, it's hard to let go, you know, yeah. and it's really hard to let go of that past. It's like, it's something that has to be learned, you know, in many cases, I think. Oh, I completely agree. And that's part of the discussion with the book is this idea that when you hold on to something for so long and it's become part of how you define yourself, yeah. when you let it go, or can you let it go? And if you do, are you the same person? Can you still have your memories and your history without the grief that came along with it? Right. You know, it's, uh, you know, many people, I think, fear letting go because they don't know who their identity will be. They're that new person. Who will it be? You know, the 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 uh, fear of the unknown, you know, and uh, not knowing what you will become once you let, you know, that dark side or let that past you know, be gone. Absolutely. And it comes with that idea of change is both inevitable, but the thing that we fear most, where even if it's a positive change, we as, as humans would prefer to stay in the hell treatment that we know mm -hmm. than move into a positive space because we fear what that space would be, even though we know it could be better than where we are now. Right. And, you know, I've seen so many people, you know, um, you know, suffer from that. You know, they they rather be living in an unhappy state of mind than to move forward because they're so afraid of who that that next person will be. And will they like that person? Will they like who the person they become? Yeah. Or if the people around them will like that person. Right. Yes. We fear so much that if we take the steps to change, then the other people around us who haven't taken those steps will judge us, will try to bring us back down. Or if we have to leave those people behind to a degree as well. And yeah. that's scary in its own right, whether they're friends or family. And then we're sitting there saying, well, if they don't believe in me or if they're stuck here when I'm trying to move to here, what, what will happen next? And that's part of the change. Sometimes right. we can't take them with us. And I've heard people say that, you know, they they were afraid to let go of certain things because then they weren't they didn't know if their friends are going to like them, if they you know, will they lose those people in their lives that they value so much and they were actually afraid to make those changes because they were afraid that the people that they, they cared about so much and the people that, you know, they uh, liked wouldn't like them, you know, if they saw this new person. Yeah, I I think people have to realize, too, that, you know, if they're your real friend or if they really care about you, they're going to like you no matter what. Yeah, right. I mean, that's the big idea. For instance, uh, I used to tell people that I'll help them move, even though I had no intention of actually showing up to help them move. And <laughs> about like why I couldn't help them move when really I just should have been honest from the get go. I don't want to help people move. I hate right. it. Then. I hate it now. Now I have a bad back, so I actually can't help people move. But right. if that wasn't the case. I'd still not do it. But just being upfront about it is yes. like, still going to be my friend, even though I'm not going to help them move their refrigerator. It's OK. Right. Like, it's OK. Exactly. Like, and I think people people get upset when you're not fully honest and upfront with them. So if you say one thing and then you do the opposite, I think then they get upset. You know, if you're upfront and honest and you say, you know, I'd like to help you, but, you know, I, you know, I have have a bad back or, you know, or be honest, you know, you know, I it's not really my thing, but, you know, I'm there for you. I support you, you know, and, you yeah. know. Congratulations on your move. I'm not helping, but I'm happy for you. Exactly. <laughs> there. You put it perfectly. <laughs> so now you also do screenwriting also. So tell me about a little about that. Yeah, I was lucky enough to make a great connection. My brother-in-law was in the industry and he did a lot of uh, corporate storytelling. And so mm -hmm. I jumped on board with that and we had some great times and great involvement and exploration with that in, in ways that were really interesting and unique of, of this different idea of how can a company or a brand tell its story in an authentic and meaningful way yeah. while still seeming, not seeming, but still being truthful, right? Because we all right. have seen how corporations have to speak to a wider audience and yet at the yeah. same time it can ring false or it can ring hollow and we're all sitting there rolling our eyes being like oh yeah this company really cares about the environment or, right. or whatever it is and this was really a practice and an exercise of well one where are they being honest with whatever they're trying to say yeah what are they actually doing and mm -hmm. 
how can we tell this story to demonstrate these things both internally and externally? And then from there, him and I started making these side projects and these side screenplays that were really about the types of stories that we like to tell, yeah, the types of movies we love and directors we love and writers we love. And mm -hmm. part of the concept, we were just playing around with these ideas of like doing five minute short films that were homages to different types of movies and directors we love that were just mashups. Like what if Martin Scorsese directed Back to the Future? Like what would that look like? And I would just write these shorts, like the, the first five minutes of what that would look like. Oh, really? And so I have all these different shorts, but also part of it was, oh, what if Quentin Tarantino directed Indiana Jones? So I, wrote, <laughs> I wrote an entire screenplay with that concept in mind. Oh, and really? so it's these types of things that are just like, they're there and talking to people and, and trying to get them out into the world. But there are a lot of, there are a lot more fun exercises that I do that still tell similar stories with this deeper, richer connection, character based with these elements of magic. But uh, a far different type of story than I tell than what I'm telling my fiction, which is really these explorations of trauma and character relationships, character dynamics, and and how to, and, and kind of those stories of even intergenerational trauma and the way that we express, move on and move forward. So did you uh, make any types of shorts or a trailer or any kind of like um, any little mini movies through these screenplays or you're basically you just writing them out and kind of put them to the side? Well, maybe one day kind of thing. With the shorts, we were actually in process of making one that was going to be a promo that we ended up not being able to film uh, because there were some personal tragedies, but it was still something that that we'd like to do. Yeah. And then with the other shorts, we we learned that as homages, the intellectual property is protected and we can mm -hmm. get sued. But if oh, we were really it, but if we it's so weird because they were they're homages. There's these creative ideas that obviously allude to these certain aspects, but because the the intellectual property is so strong and it's obviously what we're relating to without right. being funny, we could get sued. But if it was parody it's covered by freedom of speech. So we'd be able to parody it. And so oh, we were, really? this, yeah, we were caught in this weird gray area that we were like, well, we don't want to get sued. So we're not going to film these shorts, but we have them as kind of creative concepts that we'd love yeah. to work with and see how they can, how they can uh, grow into their own thing from there. And that's what happened with the kind of Quentin Tarantino meets Indiana Jones. It grew into its own concept that was like a full material that we're eager to get out and, and show the yeah. world. So if you basically make it funny and you just make it like a parody, you can actually, you know, do it yeah. and you won't get any legal problems. Exactly. Just somewhere randomly in the middle, just have people fall down on a banana <laughs> and uh, some random gorilla marches through for no reason. Just these little yeah. things. People are like, what's that? It's like, well, now it's a parody, so we won't get sued. <laughs> <laughs> You know, some people do animation and some people have people act out the characters and actually play the scenario and stuff like that. That's actually something you could do, too. Like, you know, I, I see a lot of people sometimes they do animation and animation has become so big and, you know, people kind of like it also. Yeah, and that would be interesting. And there are a few that would definitely work as animation or even stop animation. So something yeah. like Nightmare Before Christmas that gives it that little that little creepy element as well. Yeah. You know, fit that, that really well. Yeah. Well, look how the Grinch did, you know, the Grinch played like the, you know, the evil character, but everybody loved the Grinch, you know? It's true. It's true. Even my daughter, she has these Grinch pajamas that she is obsessed with and she loves the Grinch during the season, but you're right. I mean, he's just this awful, awful character <laughs> obviously it becomes great at the end, but yeah. Like you're willing to follow this anti-hero who's stealing Christmas. And but I think it's because of how he's redeemed at the end that you feel so comfortable rooting for him. Like no matter what terrible thing he does, you're still at the end like, oh, he's so lovable. And it's so great that he comes around in the end. And then he forms this deep bond with Cindy Lou Who and it's magical. Yeah. Uh, so I, I constantly think about that, actually, like how, how terrible the Grinch is and you still are you're still with him the entire time 
even my dogs love the Grinch. You know, like in Christmas time, they would they would they would die for the uh, for the for the stuffed animal. We try to keep by the Christmas tree. That's the only thing they ever wanted. They would go right towards the Grinch, and then they would fight over the Grinch. You know, it's just oh, everybody that, loves the Grinch. You know, <laughs> that's so great. I don't actually know how my, my I look this way because my dog's sleeping right next to me. Yeah. I don't know how she would react to the Grinch, but she responds when there's an animal or some awkward animal type thing on the TV. She responds, she growls at them. and she <laughs> the But she hasn't with the Grinch yet. So I'm curious as to whether she will or not. Now you actually, you have like three different totally types of uh, interests that you have focused on in your career. Like, you know, what made you go in three different directions? Was it because you had d three different interests or kind of, did they kind of fall, you know, in place? Like you said, travel kind of just fell into place. You know, are these things that you always loved or are these things that kind of sometimes, you know, some things just evolve out of the blue? All of the above, actually. I mean, there are things that I've always been interested in, but with the travel writing and the script writing, they kind of fell into place, the connections mm -hmm. I made. And then the novel writing is really what the pursuit was. That was the one thing that really came hardcore. I have to figure out how I can do all these other projects while still writing novels. And it's the one yeah. thing that has definitely been, I don't want to say hobby, but that's side project. It's stuff that still gets out into the world, but I'm not yeah. sitting there nine to five typing at my computer, the novel that I'm going to publish because that it pays less and takes longer, if that yes. makes sense. No, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But the the screenwriting, you know, the connections that I just happened to have made and worked out and it was lovely and some projects that we had that I wish I could talk about that worked out really well, that were great experiences just to even see happen. Like, yeah. Just as a very vague example, there was a, a comedy writer whose production company was getting bought by another studio and there was going to be this big announcement and I was able to write the promo script for it and to see the com to, to see the comedian laugh at the script that I had wrote, written, yeah. <laughs> written was just such an enlivening experience and definitely yeah. something that I will always remember. And then with the travel writing, I mean, the the kind of through thread here is that, well, even though I might have fallen into these things or pursued in the form, uh, in the sense of the novel, it's all storytelling and it's all just different mediums for telling a story. And the stories I like to tell are the ones in which connect readers to characters yeah. and each one does that, right? Travel writing, I'm less concerned with showing someone the sense of space as I am with explaining why that sense of space matters. And with right. novels, it's a similar thing, but the sense of space is no longer necessarily where you are, but who you're with. Right. And then with the screenplays, essentially it's the same, except now it's a visual medium. So I'm showing you the sense of space and the actors are exploring with their body language, then the dialogue of why this sense of personal and physical space matter. Right. You know, I, I have like so many people who I know are that in the are in the writing industry and they've written their first book. They're really excited about it. And, you know, you see so many different types of PR agencies and people that says I could make you famous and blah, 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 blah. And they charge an arm and a leg, you know, for you, was it you self-promoting yourself most of the time? Or was it, did you go to a PR agency and have them help you make, you know, positive connections? What did you do to actually make the connections you did so you could expand your career? I did it myself. I would not necessarily recommend it. There are great PR agencies out there and I would have loved to work with them. I reached out to a few and the truth is they all charged about the same amount. So yeah. I didn't feel like they were coming to me with some random number and I would say that's exorbitant, but I did my homework to learn right. oh, about what would it cost. And so I understood that's okay. That's typical for that space. I mm -hmm. don't think they're going to scam me. I just didn't have it. Right. right. So I couldn't spend money I didn't have. And because of that, I was just looking at, okay, well, what avenue could I go that I can do myself because I have the time right now, but not the money, or at least I can make the time. Yeah. So I joined some different groups. I reached out to different podcasts, including you. Thanks for having yeah. me. 
You're welcome. Uh, but just, just I pursued every avenue that I could and made cold calls, made cold emails, went through different mediums of uh, of places where they maybe had like aggregates of of media that I could reach out to through that way. Yeah, and it it did take time, and I had to develop my own understanding of what worked best for my book or for my PR purposes. Yeah, some of them like I'm not gonna go on a show that's talking about foot health right? to PR my book because I have nothing to say about that and no connection to it. Yes. But, but I also understood that my book has to deal a lot with like mental health and even physical health as a writer, how I stay, how do I stay mentally healthy and physically healthy when I'm sitting at my desk yeah. for nine to 10 hours a day. And so like exactly. I could go on health shows and talk about that, or I could go on writing shows and talk about my writing process or et cetera, et cetera. So really understanding how I could get into the niche yes. areas and mm-hmm. reach wider audiences, as opposed to trying to break through the noise of like, just go on social media where right. there's 1 billion posts a day. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, I hear that from most people, you know, including myself, you know, when, you know, you can, you know, when you're a writer, you're on a limited budget and, you know, unless you're a celebrity and, you know, someone else is writing the book for you and you're making, you know, millions and millions of dollars because every book company wants to hear your story, you know, writers are limited on what they have and what they could actually pay. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you know, trying to market yourself to the right audience and trying to put, you know, and, and trying to keep yourself above water. And, you know, and I think that's a great point. Stay within your audience, you know, try to make connections as best as you can. And it's very hard, I think, too, in the social media world, it's like, you know, there's so much competition out there. And, you know, it's hard sometimes to get noticed, you know, on social media, you know, and, um, I always, you know, suggest sometimes, you know, making a page and, you know, putting yourself out there and then, you know, trying to find people who are interested in you. And then you could advertise to that audience, you know, and, you know, that's one way of doing it. But yeah, it's a it's a hard industry. But, you know, what did you do for so you didn't get burnout? Because I know for myself, I was I love to write and I could spend hours and hours in front of the computer. But then sometimes I found myself very drained. And you can get to that point where you're so drained, you're kind of burnt out. Did you ever feel like you put so much effort and by and after a while, it kind of it kind of wear it on you? A hundred percent. There's there's a few different ways that I deal with it. And one of the ways is giving myself the grace to burn out because you do sit there and focus. And it's not even just the writing. It's the fact that I'm writing on top of having a day job where I'm writing yeah. and having a three-year-old and having a wife, like these things, these areas that I want to spend my time and energy that are away from writing or that right. I have to spend away from writing. So one of the biggest burnout moments for me was during the pandemic when I was, you know, my travel writing job broke apart because no one was traveling. So I couldn't exactly do that. And I'm piecemealing together five or six jobs a day and then spending time with my daughter and spending time with my wife. And then at the end of the day, do I have the mental capacity to write? No, but I had a friend who joined a writer's group And she came to me and was like, oh, well, we're just starting doing 10 minutes. And then next week, we're going to jump to 20 and then 30 and then 40. And I think it was like six weeks. And by the end of the time period, you were doing like hour long rights. And I was like, well, I don't have the mental capacity or the time for that, but I can do 10 minutes. So how about you and I sit down and we'll do 10 minute rights five nights a week. And but then I would do six nights. So six nights a week, I would sit down for 10 minutes. I would set the timer no Mm -hmm. longer than 10 minutes, no matter where I was in the story or what I was doing after But then it became a game like, okay, uh, I wrote 500 words in 10 minutes last night. Can I write an entire chapter tonight in 10 minutes or I write a thousand words in 10 minutes? And then I would just see how long it went and how far I could go. And I actually, the novel that's coming out without the release date, either next winter or in 2024, that's a product of that practice. It was 10 minute writes, six nights a week. And I finished an entire novel. Wow. (laughs) So it worked. I mean, I won't lie. I'm currently in the middle of burnout right now, like just writing burnout right now. I haven't written in probably a month, which is very unlike 
me, but at the same time, I'm researching my next book. I'm marketing for life between seconds. Yeah. And I'm, I'm waiting for notes on the next book that's supposed to come out. So there's a lot still, there's a lot of moving parts that are still working. So even though I'm not necessarily writing, just like when you did five years of research for your book, there are still elements that go into the next book, even if yes. I'm not writing it yet. Right. Exactly. And what do you suggest for people who start to feel burnt out, like move away from it, kind of renew yourself? What what do you suggest? Yeah, renewing yourself is exactly what I think you should do. It's not necessarily about what I do, because what I do that works for me might not work for you. Just like the 10 minutes, the 10 minute writes that worked for me might not work for somebody who writes slowly and really deeply, but I can write really fast and we'll go back and finish editing later. So I don't care about how many grammatical mistakes or spelling mistakes I make. But for what works for me is like, I go on long walks. I love hiking with my dog. I love uh, going and visiting a new town or even an old town and just walking around kind of the main street or these types of things that really invigorate me and liven me and renew my energy. So it's whatever is that for you, whether it's yoga or going to a fancy restaurant or just even stepping away. My own recommendation is don't step away for too long because then if you break a good habit, it's hard to get back onto that train. So like personally, I try not to do the same thing two nights in a row. row. So like if I miss writing and granted, again, I haven't written for a month, but like if I miss researching or if I miss connecting to my story two nights in a row, I feel like, oh, I broke the chain where (laughs) one night is me giving, like giving me myself that grace and saying, I can recuperate, I can rest, I can come back with fresh eyes and fresh mind tomorrow and, and everything's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's saying to yourself, you know, to, to give yourself a, a certain stop point and then actually stop. Yeah. And, and believe it, I mean, granted again, what works for everybody, but for me, if you write to the point of burnout, getting that energy back and that focus back after burnout, isn't just a matter of resting and coming back the next day. Cause you're burnt out. It takes right. a lot longer to to recuperate oh yeah so if you don't reach that point and then you rest and recuperate you mm-hmm. come back with full force and full energy as opposed yes. to having to build yourself from the ground up exactly exactly very good point now you have a website right you have a, a website people can go to learn a little bit about you absolutely douglasweissman.com it's my first name last name.com pretty easy as long as you get the spelling right it's right there for you <laughs> <laughs> And where can you find your books? So my books are anywhere books are sold right now. They actually sold out of the first print, which is incredible. Yeah, it's very good. Now, I will be up front with you. I don't know how many they printed. So it could have just been 100, 500, 1000. I don't know, yeah. but it sounds amazing just to hear it as a writer. Of course, they, yeah. They, you sold out of your first print, but you can get it at Barnes Noble, bookshop.org. History of Press is the publisher. Mm-hmm. So you can reach it there if you'd like. It's actually cheaper there than it is on the other sites. And of course you can get it Amazon and Target. They sell it on Target as well, which was also another exciting moment to see. That it is a very exciting moment. Yeah. Target app, I was, I, I think I was dancing in my kitchen and showed my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we're there all the time. Let's just buy it off of Target. <laughs> now your book that's coming out in, in 2024, is it going to be like a sequel to this book or is it going to be something completely different? It is completely different. So It deals with ideas of trauma Mm -hmm. in a very different way, which just seems to be one of those things I gravitate towards. So I'll be upfront. I'm Jewish. I I was born and raised in the Jewish community. I'm still very immediately connected to my culture. Yes. And sorry, pardon me. I have a, I live next to a train track. So if you heard, (laughs) but one of the big things about that is that intergenerational trauma, the Holocaust pogroms mm-hmm. in Eastern Europe, they ha- they they weigh heavily over my community and oh, over yeah. me even because of the people I know who are connected to those and those who were affected by it, whether with loss or with growth. But at the same yeah. time, everybody kind of knows somebody who was a part of it. So yeah, with Life Between Seconds, it, it focuses on it in a different way where there's Sophia from Argentina and her daughters disappeared in the dirty war in Argentina that took place between the 1970s, 1980s. And it was kind of this 
this understanding of, well, I understand this part of it because of my community. And what happens if I dig deeper, understanding that this person, part of the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, uh, who are these women who would march through the presidential square holding signs or pictures demanding to know the whereabouts of their family who were disappeared during that time. And it affected me so much when I saw it that I needed to learn more, talk to people, research. And it made me think, well, what would my mom do if she was waiting for me to come home? Uh, yeah. and, and I went down that that rabbit hole. And right. with the book that comes out in 2024, it kind of deals with trauma, but in a different way, because that's now looking at a serial killer in occupied Paris in World War II. So it's wow. kind of how we were talking about the Grinch, right? It's yeah. like a horrible person who you root for. And I was looking at it in the same way where, well, how do we get ourselves to root for a serial killer? Right. And, and it's okay. Well, if I put her and, and she's a woman, if I put her in this space uh, and she's doing kind of the wrong thing, but for the right reasons, are we yeah. going to follow her and feel empowered and, and really want to see her succeed? And yeah. that was the exploration of, of that book. So again, still trauma and, and very graphic, but in a very different way. <laughs> Wow, that sounds very exciting. Uh, very exciting. Now, do you have all your books listed on your website? Do I have all my books listed on my website? I have the Life Between Seconds listed on my website. Mm -hmm. And I have where you can find other stories that I've written. But there are a few books that I do not have listed on my website as of yet because I need to get more affiliate links for them. Uh, right. You can find the only place to find the books that I published before Life Between Seconds is on Amazon. Okay. So yeah, those are, that's the only provider of those books. All right. And yeah. also your travel blog, like, do you have that on your website or is that a separate website? Uh, that, I have not touched that since 2017, 2016. Okay. So it's something that still exists out there in the ether somewhere, but it yeah. hasn't been updated. Uh, if you do stumble upon it, I both apologize and congratulate you. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for the terrible writing, but I congratulate you for finding it because it is difficult to find. <laughs> uh, but but if you want to see where I've been and how I've traveled and things like that, it's definitely out there. It's just not, it is not connected to my website currently. Yeah. It's kind of like, a, what is it? I think Stephen Ricks, uh, well, um, he's an, he's another travel uh a uh, writer. Um, he did. Oh, Rick some, Steves. Yes, that's. I couldn't think of it. Rick Steves. Was, yes. You got the names right, just in the opposite order. Opposite the order. Yeah, my yeah. whole life, the opposite order. <laughs> 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 yeah. So you know, he was he was a very good travel writer. Also, he's you know, I I I downloaded quite a few of his books, and and he was you know he went to places, and he was spot on, you know, and so I could have downloaded you. I didn't know that you were writing, you know, travel writing. Very different, very different experiences, but he was spot on. Actually, there's a lot of places that have changed the way that they interact with tourists because yeah. of his work and the way that, say, Cinque Terre is such a beautiful place in Italy, the the five towns off the Ligurian coast, but it was very little known until he went there and then it blew up. And now it's like one of the most popular destinations to visit in Italy. Yeah. When I went to Italy, I downloaded his, his book and I actually, you know, I was visiting places and he said where to go, where not to go. And, you know, and he was always spot on with what he had to say. So it was, it was pretty good. You know, I, I really enjoyed, you know, um, you know, you know, reading travel writing, you know, and, and from another person's perspective, you know, and uh, it was really a great experience, but, you know, it has been a pleasure to have you on the show before we go do you want to give anybody any tips any people who have maybe you know are you know interested in fictional writing and you know either they they want to do it or maybe they they're unsure how to do it or they they're in it right now do you have any tips to help people along the, the whole ride I have terrible tips that are going to sound really generic so I'm going to have to explain a little bit but it's just okay. it's just right like that is both the best and worst tip you can get, right? When yeah. someone's like, how can I write? It's like, well, you just do it. That's terrible. How, what? But mm -hmm. the big thing is that the only story that won't be told is the story unt untold, right? Yeah. So if you are if you have a story and you don't write it, it's not going to get told. Right. So you have to sit there and do it. And that's the hardest part. But 
what we talked about throughout our time together was really touching on the important topics of you have to find what works for you because that's what's going to get you in the chair every time. And yes. if 10 minutes works for you, then do 10 minutes. If two hours work for you once a week, then do those two hours. But right. everybody's different. Everybody works differently. And therefore, when you find what keeps you coming back to the table and you built kind of a ritual around it, like I had a friend who every time he went to write, he would light a candle, right? So it was like this one specific Tahitian vanilla scented candle and he would only light it when he wanted to write. But then right. by lighting it, it got him in that mental space. I'm going to yes. write now. And if you can put in a system like that, a little ritual that gets you ready and that you turn off your phone, you put away the whiskey and you just sit there and you focus on the yeah. words for 10 minutes for one hour, whatever it is, that's that's how you do it. I For a while, I was doing it at six o'clock in the morning. Then I was doing it 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> then it was seven o'clock at night. I mean, it right. changed, but I had that ritual always where boom, phone goes off 10 minutes, put on the timer, put on one song on mm -hmm. repeat. So I'm not sitting there trying to make a playlist. It's just one song on repeat the whole time that it just becomes white noise. Right. Boom. I'm in it. And that's, so it's again, terrible advice, but the best advice you're going to get just, no, just I don't right. think it. I don't think it's terrible <laughs> advice. I think it's good advice because sometimes you just write and then things come to you. I know I always say like, sometimes you have to listen to your inner voice. Sometimes things could just out of the blue start coming through your head. And I think that's the best time to write, you know, or when yeah. you're emotional too. Sometimes, you know, when you're emotional, you know, you start, you connect with your inner self and then, you know, things just start flowing, you know, you kind it's another way of, of doing it too. And I like the idea of the candle, putting yourself in that serene, relaxed mode so you could actually think and you could actually, you know, have more clarity, you know? So right. those, are, those are great tips. I really yeah. like them. Well, Jody Pickle said that you can't edit a blank page, right? So you can, if, if you're sitting there, editing things in your head before you even put it down on the page, nothing's going to come out of it. If you sit there editing in your head before it's on the page, you're going to talk yourself out of writing. Right. Is, it doesn't matter how bad it is. As long as it's on the page, you can change it later. Exactly. Exactly. And you know what? I think too, if someone writes and, and the first book isn't that great, don't give up. Just yeah. keep trying because you'll get better and better. And, you know, one day you might actually reach that goal, but you won't reach that goal if you give up. So keep on trying, keep on chugging, exactly. you know? Right. Failure is all about perception mm -hmm. where it's like if you give up, then you fail because you gave up. But if you keep going, you look back and that perceived failure is now a learning experience. Exactly. That's very well put. Now, tell everyone, before you go, tell everyone one more time where they can find you so they remember. Right. DouglasWeisman.com. That's my website. I'm really active on LinkedIn. You can find me at Douglas Weisman. You can also find me on Instagram where I'm reading every single page of my book, one page, five days a week. So if you want to hear how it sounds, you can go all the way back to page one and start listening. Oh, wow. That's a great idea. I like that idea. So you Thanks. read one page on Instagram a day. One and page a day. Now, is this the book that you, which, which book is this out of the eight books that you wrote? This is Life Between Seconds, my most recent release. So oh, okay. my, in theory, by the time I'm done reading this, my next book will be out. So, okay. So and then I'll not, start with that one. <laughs> you're, not, you're not worried that you're giving away too much of the book by doing that? No, because someone really has to be committed to listen to every single page before they actually dig into the book. Right. Like, it's 270 pages plus or minus. So <laughs> you're going to be stuck with me for 270 days or you just buy the book. Right. And you spend 10 hours reading it. Yes. So it might be That's, a little easier. <laughs> I actually like that idea. I might steal that from you. I kind of like that idea. <laughs> That's going to be fun. I'm not, I'm not worried. Take it. Run with it. You know, you should try that too on YouTube Shorts because right now YouTube Shorts is actually doing better than the videos itself. And you know you what? I should. I didn't even think about that. And I definitely should bump up YouTube. Yeah, I would do both. I would do an Instagram reel and then I would do I would do a YouTube short, you know, okay. 
Just one more, one more to my social media list. Exactly. Exactly. Douglas, it has been a pleasure talking to you today. I had such a great time. You gave such valuable information and your, your stories are very exciting. I love how you write. I love the idea of, you know, you're learning, but yet you're in a fictional world. You're putting yourself, you know, in a make-believe world, but there's a purpose behind that make-believe world. So I really like that. And, you know, good luck to you and everything you do. And, you know, I hope to have you maybe back on the show. And thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's been my pleasure. It's really been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. You too.